everyone. Welcome to Grounds for Sculpture for our second of three series of cultural conversations. This program started a year ago with a grant from the New Jersey Council of Humanities, working with Grounds for Sculpture, uh, myself, um, Donia Salem, and Dr. Leanne Francis. They have been the leads, and I've been supporting them as a member of Grounds for Sculpture. Uh, this is a series which is bringing in multidisciplinary artists and students from TCNJ to kind of reinterpret our current exhibitions that we have with Roberto Lugo and the Color Network. Now, if you haven't had a chance to see those exhibitions, we'll talk about them here, but um, that is kind of the basis for the inspiration and to bring in different points of view from outside Grounds for Sculpture and outside the, the uh, curatorial context of the exhibition. So I just want to introduce the leads on this project. This is Donia Salem to my right. Donia has been very generous with her time. They have gone through, both, both Donia and Dr. Leanne have been generous with their time. The process started in June with many, many visits. This is not just a one-time thing that we're making up. This has been literally six months of research and conversations uh, by the students and the artists involved. Okay, so they have been the leads on that. Uh, Donia Salem is a disabled Egyptian American artist, executive director of the Outlet Dance Project. As an artist, writer, dancer, and herbalism apprentice, um, she has also been Grounds for Sculpture's inaugural performing artist in residence and has worked with Grounds for Sculpture for many, many, many years. So I'm very grateful for her consideration and attention to detail. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Leanne Francis uh, has been co-leading the project, and she is very humble in her approach. Um, she has been you know, talking about being an artist. She's also been very um, a wise, wise person in working with learning for myself and with Donia. Uh, Dr. Leanne Francis is an associate professor in both the Department of African American Studies and of Women's Gender and Sexual Studies at the College of New Jersey. Uh, she has written many, uh, she has a whole, excuse me, she holds a PhD in the United States in African American history, an MA in US and world history, and a BFA in painting and illustration. You said you were not an artist. No, she, <laughs> last time she said she was not an artist, but we gave her a hard time. <laughs> Uh, so these two are really the heart and soul of this project, along with the, the students and the artists they work with. So I just want to say thank you to them, and uh, Donia is going to introduce the program. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Julio. Um, first, just naming that the land that we are standing on, that we are sitting on, is uh, we are on Lenape Hoking. This is the unceded territory of the Lenai Lenape people. So just naming that. So, and just naming that this has been a process of remembering, of research, of revisioning, and revisiting again and again. We've come, what happens when we go, when we see an artwork again and again? What happens when we are engaged in circles of conversation, right? Conversations that build on one another, right? So what happens with, with that type of deep exploration? Um, so it has been a great joy and pleasure and honor to be a co-learner with Gabrielle Smith over the past several months. The stretch of time has been a, a, a joy, actually, a great joy <clears throat> to, to walk with her mm -hmm. uh, in, in these conversations. So um, we spent a lot of time uh, sitting with the work, considering you'll see, um, and you'll be actually uh, hearing much more about some of the different works. But this is really just a kind of introduction to say who all is in the conversation. So we all are in this conversation together and naming and how important it is to name, right? And by naming, we can remember. It leaves a deeper impression on us. And, and um, we actually find more of ourselves in the naming. So, um, so I am naming what a great joy it has been to be with Gabrielle, um, to walk in this way. And then I, I think I'm handing the mic over at this time um, to you. I think that's what's happening. So, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so this is just also to name, this is the second in a series of three conversations, cultural conversations. We'll have another one coming up December 15th. We'll hope you join us. Um, but so excited for you all to be here. I think this will be such a, a, a great gift and to, be, to be together. Thank you so much for that introduction. Dunya, I really appreciate it. And while we're here today, we're going to be exploring a lot of different themes. 
And I'm going to kind of reintroduce us, even though we've already heard our like formal introductions with credentials and everything. Um, but I'm going to introduce us in terms of our relationships with each other, because that's another thing that we have been exploring is our relationships with each other and how knowledge is passed from generations to generations and how it lives within us and lives within our mentors and our mentees. So Dr. Francis is actually my professor. Um, Francis, Dr. Francis is the one who, I don't want to say pulled me in because that's negative connotation, <laughs> who drew me, sucked me, sucked us on. That's not good. Who invited me, there we go, yeah. <laughs> invited is good. Who invited me into this experience, so I appreciate that. Um, thank you so much. And I know that brilliant author, Gil Jackson, um, has mentored <laughs> the person who also mentored me during this experience, who's Dunya, who's standing right here, who just gave an amazing speech. Um, so this is like, you can see we're sitting in a formation where it's kind of like teacher, student, teacher. teacher, student, teacher to me, student, all three of you guys, teachers to me <laughs> as students. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and we're also going to delve, dive into storytelling as another sort of theme. Um, and I believe Dr. Jackson is going to share a few stories with us right now. You want to say one thing? Um, so I began studying with Dr. Gail Jackson over a decade ago. Um, and there was a beautiful recognition the first time we saw one another and came into one another's embrace. Um, Dr. Gail Jackson is an esteemed scholar, artist, archivist, storyteller, dancer, performing artist, extraordinary human being, the best letter writer I have ever known. Um, everything that she does is with great thoughtfulness and with uh, deep nuance, with encyclopedic understanding. She's a brilliant synthesizer. I feel so touched, actually, that she's here. It means she is one of the most important people to me in the world. And so it means so much to be introducing you all to her and introducing her to all of you. And so the circling begins. Ooh, how do you follow that? I want to continue to see this radiant circle and represent our circles of conversations by greeting you in the Natik language of the Shinnecock, as my elders, my teachers, our ancestors taught me to do. Hakame. That's how you do it. Hakame. 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 Get a little rhythm now. Hakame. Hakame. Welcome in the Natik language of the Shinnecock, who are among the first peoples of the little long island that I live on, in the place they call Brooklyn now. I also want to greet you in the language of the Abenaki, who too are among our indigenous our ancestral presences. Among the Abenaki, they say, Tone Kadalose. One more time now. Tone Kadalose. That's so beautiful, right? Which actually, when we translate it into English, literally it means, I salute the shining path that brought you to this place and that brought us together. So I salute this path, Tone Karalose. I want to say honoring our Afro-African diaspora artist, scholar, student, and her radiant journey. I want to I wanna say also to you, Akwaba. <laughs> She's used to me. <laughs> Akwaba. Akwaba. In the Twi language of Ghana. Akwaba, welcome. Welcome. I am so honored to join these circles of conversation and to join this brilliant artist, 
See, I keep calling you artists. <laughs> this brilliant student, artist, scholar, on her journey in this that I trust is just the beginning of a long, healthy, flourishing journey. So I'm seeding with some stories that represent the, the few circles of conversations we've been in, but also how all conversations, all art making is a part of a vast web of conversation, or so it seemed to me. So one, I try to make it a little quick, sometimes quick and slow. Okay, one, uh, how Dina Shoney, right, how Dina Shoney tell us that hmm, the first people came from the sky. The first people came from the sky, they say, and they say that it was a woman who fell or maybe got pushed through the hole in the sky wall, through a hole in the sky world, and that she was falling, 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 falling down through space and time, falling so long she forgot her name, but she held on to a seed a seed in her hand. They say she was falling towards nothing but water. That this place we call Earth was nothing but water. But that the water birds saw her falling. That the water animals got together. That the water animals worked together, brought turtle front, put some mud on turtle's back so that they could catch her. They say that Turtle's back, which she landed on, became this land called the Great Turtle Island. One story, two stories. San say, and San among our Ancestral presence is the great, 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 and the firefly who illuminates. They say that one night Moon called on the firefly. Moon said, I have an important message for you to carry. Moon said, you take these words to the people. Moon said, you tell them that as I, the moon, wane, disappear, but return after I seem to be gone, so they too will always live on beyond dying. Got that? Got it? Okay. So the firefly went. With its wings kissing the sky, the firefly fly and fly and fly through the sky towards the village. But before it got there, it was stopped by the hare, H-A-R-E, who asked, where you going, one firefly? Firefly said, I am taking Moon's words to the people. Firefly said, Moon told me to tell them that as she, the moon, wanes, disappears, but returns after she seems to be gone, so they too will always live on beyond dying. Well, Hare, H-A-R-E, and Hare, H-E-R-E, -E, was the trouble's beginning. Hare told Firefly that she was just too slow with all the flying. Hare told Firefly that he would quickly carry words forward from the moon to the people. She said, okay, he took off. Hare raced to the village and in his haste, he raced to the village and in his haste, he raced to the village and in his haste, he lost moon's words. So Hare stood before the people 
gathered in the circles of the night. Here stood before the people gathered up from near and far and said, as the moon dies with the sunrise, so you too will perish and be gone. Hmm. And believing this, the people went. So that to this day, we have it wrong. We think that the dead are gone. Even though the moon keeps trying to remind us as it dances on the wind. Last story for now. For now. Ashanti say that the spider, the interpreter, the explicator, the creator, the spider once came upon a calabash. You know what a calabash is? <laughs> is, that a, is that a little hand raised or something? <laughs> Shout it out. Was it a calabash? Yes, yeah, a gourd kind of thing. <laughs> good for hiding things, good for cups, good for storage. Well, Spider tried to store all the world's knowledge. And I loved looking at what is knowledge, as this scholar's been doing. All the songs, all the dances, all the poems, all the stories, all the visual inscriptions, all the sculpting and carving. Spider took all of that knowledge in that calabash, tried to climb to the top of a tree to hide it so that spider could keep all the knowledge in the world to itself so it could have, it thought, great power. Well, Spider kept trying to climb up the tree with the calabash and kept sliding back down. Kept trying to climb up the tree with the calabash, kept sliding back down. Kept trying to climb up the tree with the calabash, kept sliding back down. And then along came a student scholar. And the student scholar said, Spider, Anansi, what you doing? Why don't you put the calabash on your back? so you can use your hands and legs to climb. And they say, here was Spider with all the knowledge in the world being told what to do by a student, scholar. So they say, maybe it fell, but probably a Nancy, the spider, threw the calabash to the ground the knowledge was shattered, fragmented, blown on the four winds, scattered. And they say, among the Ashanti, that the work of the scholar is like that of the storyteller, like that of the spider. You have to know all the knowledge is not in one place. And then you gather them, the threads of knowledge, and weave them back together. That is your work. Gabby, tell us about your weaving. Thank you. Thank you so much for those beautiful <laughs> creation stories. Hello. Mm -hmm. you okay. This? You want this one? No, this one works. Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much about your creation stories. And yes, I do feel like throughout these past couple of months, I have been receiving information from different places and piecing it together and tying in themes from different sculptures and tying in themes from different readings online and themes from different podcasts and different uni uni YouTube videos and assembling them all into sort of this disjointed idea of what the diaspora is mm -hmm. and what the experience is 
as a black person, as a black woman, as a person of color, as a person of any minority, um, as a, a student, it's just this idea of taking different ideas from different places. Um, and this also relates to one of the main pieces, which is right behind me. Um, if you guys notice, it looks like a giant triangle, and this is actually called Ostracons of the Atlantic. And when I first came to the museum, we spent a lot of time staring at it. Uh, and I remember Dunya asked me what came to mind. That's what we did with all of the pieces. I came here at first, and I stared at them, and I looked at them from different angles, from above, from below. And at times, I thought, um, I can't, nothing's coming to me. I don't know, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. But then after a while, I realized, OK, I could, I could take traits from these. I could pull traits and come to my own conclusions. And my conclusions weren't exactly what Anina Major, who's the sculptor of this piece, had in mind when she created it. Mm. Um, but there were overlaps. Mm. And all, all of us did the same thing. And there were overlaps within all of our conclusions. Um, mm. So first, I'll explain to you guys, the, literal, the artists, what Anina Major's intentions were with this piece. Well, it's not up anymore, but mm -hmm. you guys can visualize it. Mm -hmm. It's in your head. Close your eyes. It's in, oh, it's up again. Never mind. You don't have to do that. Um, but what her intentions were, were these fragments, if you look closely, are actually seashells and also a shattered mammy caricature figure um, and combinations of her own work. They're ostracons, which were sort of melded into this triangle. And her piece is supposed to represent the fragmented history of the African diaspora and the fragility of that history all being forced together. So there's sort of a connection between our various histories. And if any, do you guys know what the African diaspora is? Does anyone not know what the African? I should explain it. Okay. You don't, oh, you don't know the African? You want to explain? I just want somebody to talk about it. Oh. Go ahead. Okay. I would love to talk about it. Um, so long ago, there, well, there's still a continent named mm. Africa. Um, mm. and this, is where, mm. <laughs> this is where the people of dark skin originated. But we were actually, if you guys have heard of the transatlantic slave trade um, and multiple other slave trades, we were scattered from Africa and thrown into the Caribbean, to America. Um, and some Africans willingly migrated. There were willing free migrations and forced migrations. Um, but basically, Africans dispersed and evolved independently in their own places and developed individual aspects of their culture, which interacted with indigenous influences that already existed on the places there were and were obviously impacted greatly by European influences, but they still retained their connection to the mm -hmm. continent mm -hmm. of Africa. Mm -hmm. So that's what the diaspora is, mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. Did anyone have it? You guys mm -hmm. have anything you wanted to add to the diaspora? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No? Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this piece, the Ashokans of the Atlantic, describes fragmented histories mm -hmm. of the diaspora. Um, and that was a very a theme that stood out to me a lot. I feel like we always ended up circling back to this piece throughout our studies. Um, and one thing that we noticed within this piece was how tightly knit the layers were. So I wanted to ask you guys, any of you guys or anyone here who wanted to answer, do you feel as though being fragmented hmm. without knowledge of how it happened can strengthen a connection? Hmm. Do you think fragmentation without knowledge could, poten could potentially make a connection stronger than it would have been mm. if you fully understood your history. Mm. Because it's more of like an innate connection, you understand what I'm saying? Mm. Than like a, oh, this is, mm. this, is what you, this is why you're connected. Oh, you have this and this in common. You know what I'm saying? Like, so for example, I know that within black, because my mother's Haitian American, Within Haitian culture and African culture, there's a lot of overlap. There's similar dances, there's similar music, and we don't necessarily know like, oh, Mr. whatever invented this dance, so this is why we all do it the same way. But there's sort of like an innate, just like there's a similarity. Mm. And some people don't even recognize mm. it, but it exists. Mm. So do you guys feel that mm. stronger without that mm. specific knowledge? or? Mm. Mm. 
feel like that's such an interesting question. Well, talking to the mic. I, because I wasn't really talking to the mic, I was talking to Gabby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It feels like such an interesting question. Um, and, and so I, I want to reflect it back and, and hear some of what you're thinking, as well as open to the room if there were thoughts out there. Um, one of the things, uh, when, you, when you rightly ask us, do we know what an African diaspora is, um, there's a place in which there are multiple circles, cycles of African diaspora. Right? That if we go back to the beginning of human time before Africa was called Africa, then we are talking about a land where most of our shared human ancestors, our shared great, 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 come from. So there's this human journey that has taken us from a homeland over the last, oh, how many? 300,000 years, they try to say, has taken us to all the different places that we've called homeland, right? So there's this ancient history diaspora. Does not knowing that help us still connect or, or hinder our connection? Like when I meet you in the grocery store, Maybe there is a way, Gabby, where I know that we're both human. And then there are also ways in terms of the constructions of power, right? The stealing of all the knowledge. Where not remembering that we came from the same place or why we dance the same or talk the same or bleed the same blood mm, supports us in... in, in segregating groups of people, right? And in um, raising groups of people up uh, above others. So, so it feels like a double-edged sword, Gabby. Um, and, and so double, double, double. There's also, so, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking about heads shaking that people understand what I'm saying. There, there's this ancient diaspora that we could call African, but before Africa had that name, where, where we come from, the beginning of time. And then there's a fairly more recent African diaspora that we are speaking of when we talk about, um, and, 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 and Dr. Sister Professor could come in on this, right? When we talk about the African diaspora, right? we're often referring to the the diasporic motion that arose out of the mm, invasion, um, dismemberment, um, mm, 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 right? destruction of so many African civilizations in, from which people were kidnapped. Let's get it right, kidnapped enslaved and brought to the Atlantic, Astrakhan Atlantic, brought it to the Atlantic region to serve enslavement. So does not knowing that history, I, I, so many of us don't necessarily know that history, but we still dance to the music, right? Or we still sing those songs at our funerals? So, oh, right, we, this, right. so we get it in some place. And, 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 and maybe getting it more is good too. So I, I'm wondering with you. Yeah, I agree, mm -hmm. I agree. I think that memory is important as well as knowledge, understanding, context, and how we're connected with each other. I think that's very important. Um, you mentioned earlier how we all, uh, as a civilization, originated out of Africa. Um, and it reminded me of something that I saw on the internet the other day. Um, I saw Meryl Streep in an interview 
uh, saying she was African. And at first I was like, wow, let me, I didn't know that. Maybe she's white passing. Uh, she is not, her parents are um, white and she is also white. So I was like, what's she talking about? So I kept looking. Uh, she was referring to the fact that, she was referring to that history that we all as a, you know, as a race, as the human race originated out of Africa. So it, it something, you know, that didn't seem right at all. Her as this white woman claiming Africa. Mm. So at, she was referring to a history that's true, but at the same time, she's benefited mm. from a system which has mm. oppressed those who mm -hmm. are African mm -hmm. and appear mm -hmm. African in the sense that like our society has currently, mm -hmm. in that definition that our society has currently developed mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. to have. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it brings in the question of how do we identify in ways that acknowledge the truth, that mm -hmm. acknowledge like the, hi the shared history, mm -hmm. and how do we recognize that shared history mm -hmm. without without being sort of colorblind and turning into this. Because we, what's mm -hmm. the, like, what is that importance mm -hmm. of recognizing identity and how do we mm -hmm. do both at mm -hmm. the same time? Mm -hmm. There's mm. a whole lot going on up here. <laughs> Are you all with us? Okay, so here's my contribution. So what I'm understanding is Mer Meryl Streep, who is, and I'm, she's a brilliant act. She's just, I love, I think she's a fab, fabulous actress. Um, but that aside, <laughs> Meryl Streep is recognizing the land that's called Africa, which is comprised of a lot of countries, right? So it's the birthplace of humanity. Okay, so it's the birthplace of humanity. Meaning that everybody is the descendant of everybody that's, you know, it all started in Africa. And you are having a reaction to Meryl Streep, to this white woman, claiming um, an African identity when it is the three of us, people that look like us, we are thought of as, we're Africanized, we're racial, racialized. Africa is, 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 a, is, a, is a country that's it's majority black, so people from Africa are black. I mean, it has white folks and um, Asian folks and all kinds of folks, but it's thought of as a, as a black country. Um, if you're African American, you're black identified, and so for her to claim Africa, it feels wrong that she's somehow denying her whiteness, and in denying her whiteness, she's de denying the privilege and power that comes with whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have time to get into the privilege, you know, give examples of the privilege. You just have to take me at my word that whiteness is privileged, um, and lightness, and being light-skinned, too, is privileged. Um, so she could have, she could have, that's, that reality, that knowledge, that history could be articulated in a different way. We all have an original birthplace, but we're not all treated as though, we're not all treated the same. And um, we're not all thought of, thought of, thought of in the same way. Uh, it has meaning. So whiteness, blackness, all, brownness, all these identities, um, they're made up. They are. They're made up. They're fictions. They're ideas. Uh, blackness is not in anybody's blood. You're not, you don't have black, there's no black blood, there's no white blood, there's no brown blood. But I'm not saying that race doesn't matter. Race absolutely matters. Racism is a real thing that structures everybody's lives. Um, so if she had just acknowledged that we have a shared, a shared humanity, and, but there's been a very serious fragmentation there, uh, colonialism, so the invasion of, of lands that, of indigenous lands, of lands that belong to other people, invading them and taking them over, that matters. Enslaving people, that matters. And that there are people that benefit that benefit from the enslavement of groups, from the colonization of groups. Um, there are things that divide us. There are things like that that divide us. Racism divides us. Um, and there are things that bring us together, like our blood, like our shared humanity. Does that make any sense? Because I'm not, I'm not sure sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but that would have that uh, mm -hmm. worked better, better. I want to point something out. Too. For those of you who didn't know what Gabby was referring to when uh, she brought up the Mammy figure, there'll be a bigger picture soon. Um, but the Mammy figure, I wish the bigger picture would come up now. Uh, in this piece is important, like all the pieces are important, because the, the here she is, all right, here it is. Um, Mammy, 
is a racist image, racist sex image of a black woman. Um, white folks invented her basically to portray slavery as a good thing, that black people loved being owned and you know, wanted all the violence that came with slavery and that it somehow uplifted black people from the darkness of ignorance and et cetera and so on. Um, so this artist is, is acknowledging um, people abducted and, and torn from their homelands and people, uh, black folks, people from various parts of Africa that didn't know, they did, spoke different languages, couldn't understand each other. So there's an apartness there. And then we're all brought together here in the landmass called the Americas, Turtle Island, which is understood as the United States, it's called the United States. Um, and so I'm saying that, the, uh, that I see the artist as uh, recognizing the racism that's in the history, um, the apartness of the people, and then people being brought together. And um, I also heard you saying, so I'm gonna stop talking in a moment, uh, Dr. Jackson, Gail, I heard you saying that, and Gabby, that th those histories, even if we don't know it, live inside us. They live in, inside all of us and, and bring us together somehow and pull us together somehow. And the knowing, the talking about it, the remembering, well, that's a very, very good thing, even if what we're remembering is painful and hard and confusing, um, that we get to know ourselves better and we get to know each other better and that there is some hope for us if we can um, Remember. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. word very, very much true. Mm -hmm. Very much true. Mm -hmm. um, anyone at TCNJ should also take uh, Dr. Leanne Francis's classes if they want uh, any more information. If there are any other TCNJ students, um, very informative classes. Um, but yeah. Um, I, oh no, you go ahead. Oh, you're leaving. I'm so sorry. Um, anyways, um, another thing that you had mentioned that we were talking about was dancing mm -hmm. and how dancing is something that brings us together and is sort of bridges different parts of the diaspora. And I wanted to read a little line out of your book where you mention circle dancing mm -hmm. and how you did it in your childhood. Mm -hmm. So this is some of Dr. Jackson's dancing <laughs> writings. <laughs> Inextricably paired dance and song was ritually circular, polyphonic in responses, responsive, syncopative and percussive, multimetered, subtly competitive, formally improv improvisational, and held moments in collective performance for transforming individual flights. Mm -hmm. Where you're talking about how dancing in the United States mm -hmm. is sort of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rem reminiscent of mm -hmm. the circular dancing that was so important in healing mm -hmm. in Africa. So did you want to elaborate a little bit on how those circles of dancing are connected? Let's see if the mic's on. Is it on? Yes. Well, I'm going to take your lead to invite the audience because you are, I think you're kind of city kids. Some of you are city kids, right? Yes? No? Some? And maybe even in the suburbs you do some stuff. So does anybody know any, can remember any games that you play in the street with other kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody? Can you, you want the mic? Were you going to do a dance? No. Oh. <laughs> I was just going to play the game. Go ahead. Tag. I mean, I could warm you up and then you could go in, right? Like, do you know? Miss Mary, ma, 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 all dressed in black, 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 with silver buttons, 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 all down her back, back, back. Okay, so you know, right? Wait, what were you saying? Oh, I didn't you know got you one? meant a hand game. I thought you just meant like a regular game. Yeah, but what was the regular game? Oh, it was tag. What? Tag. What? Tag? Okay, you're it. <laughs> oh, they're doing tag. Look at that. Oh, it's you, anybody else know one? Double Dutch. But what did you sing when you did Double Dutch? Come on, say one. Hot peas and butter. Come on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we would just come up with like our mm -hmm. game of whatever. Mm -hmm. Turn your 
absolutely, and absolutely, and scholars of art would would call that right historicizing, right in in metered polyphonic call and response, right? Strawberry shortcake cream on top. Tell me the name of your sweetheart, right? And she got it, you know, right? So, so when we look at what we're doing, right? When we look at the pieces of our performance, of our art making, well, then we see within that that we're actually, there's a method to our madness. Right? That we're actually engaged in storytelling, history keeping, right? We didn't have to go to school for that. But we went to school. We learned it from somewhere, right? What I'm looking at in the book is just that process, right? About how children, particularly young people and dancing, and, and, and I'm sure a few of y'all know how to move, right? that we engage in traditions that have symbolic meaning in African and African diaspora practice. Right? Right? We don't necessarily remember where they came from right? or what those meanings were, and the meanings are changing. They change over time. Right? But when we study them, we can see that. We can see the pieces of the past still operating in our art making, in our cultural conversations. How about that? To look back to that, right? right. That as kids in the street or, or even in the club, we are representing ancient, waves of speaking that we keep making into our own in the moment that we're in, right? right? Like the speaker is saying it, right? And that that is characteristically an African performance form. Right? So when we study it, we can say, oh, well, that's rooted in some shared human traditions. The racial piece, which was so um, hmm, coherently underscored by Dr. Sister, is a recent human invention. A powerful and pernicious one, like many of our inventions. But yes, there's something in our song and dance that shows the journey that tells us about the journey and that helps us on the journey. I think, and again, I'm looking around the room, but one of the things that we learn when we have to do brown girl in the ring, right? Show me your motion, right? Is to be able to stand up, whether it's at the job or in your family, in relationships, and, and be who you are, right? So it's a way that we train ourselves, right? It's a, it's a, it's a school that's among us, right? A way of learning, a way of being, right? And a way of saying certain values. So lots of things. Lots of things, right? Ooh, and, 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 and Dr. Sister Leanne, I want to keep coming back to this mammy figure, right? Like how things get flipped and flipped and flipped and flipped and flipped, right? That if we look at the, um, well, let's go back to Sky Woman, right? The water is the beginning. And there are so many world traditions that recognize hmm, the water, the mother from the water as a, as a fundamental human 
sign, like we talk about Mother Earth, right? When we talk about environmentalism, right? How we've gotten disconnected from our environment. When we look at the, and it's, where am I going with the mammy? Um, there are iterations of some, of a, of a deity of water, which in some languages is called mammy, water, right? That again and again remember water as a fundamental of our world, a fundamental of our world. So there's a way in which this mammy figure is a distortion, right? A distortion of, of things that we might, that we do hold in value, right? The, the importance of caring, the importance of, 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 of mothering, right? But, but we distort it and we make it into a caricature. The woman's on the bottom, the, the mammy's on the bottom, the, the black mammy's on the bottom of the bottom. When in fact, our oldest goddess is a black mother. In a time before we said, before those ideas were racialized, right, as, 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 as Dr. Sister Leanne said, right? We racialize those concepts, white and black. So it feels, in, and, oh, and, 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 and it feels important to be looking roundly in the way that art demands that we look. That we can't just say, oh, it's like this, or oh, it's just like this, and it's just like this. It's, it's so many ways. Is multiple stories, right? And the weaving together is so important. Right. I like that. And when you were mentioning when you were mentioning water in relation to this piece, um, I actually thought that was really interesting because one of the artist's intention was to she she described the piece as peeling back the ocean floor, like sort of creating like a I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Bible. Um, there's a, a scene, not a scene, but a moment where Moses parts the sea. So that reminded me of that. Um, it's the sculpture is kind of re like reminds me and reminded the artist, that was her intention of sort of peeling back that ocean and showing the ocean floor and bearing the truth. Um, and we discussed a lot of times the idea of water as memory. Um, it's what we're made of. It's what we drink. We need it to survive. Um, and the idea of water holding our memories. So do you guys feel that there's physical connections with these, with water that we all share? Like there's a necessity to, does it, or does anyone in this room feel a necessity to engage with water in a way hmm. of reflecting? Because water can at times be nostalgic too. Like I know that when I was younger, I would my mom would submerge me in water. She took bubble baths, and then as I got and it was very therapeutic. I like I love bubble baths, but then as I got older, that was sort of something that I just left in my childhood. Mm -hmm. But I know there are places where there's rituals that involve like being submerged into water, whereas now that's considered something infantile. But mm. there's places that retain that. So do you guys feel a physical connection with the water, anyone? Mm. Oh, I feel like it's been that it's um, like I don't know, move on, like to go to the pond and mm -hmm. your stroke and bring it back to yourself. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of like a first way to reflect and look at ourselves mm -hmm. and into the water mm -hmm. and just bring it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
We're all made out of water, mostly. Mostly. Right? And essential for life, for anything to grow. And right, this is this is a profound place where we are dismembered from basic knowledge, right? So we are polluting the thing that gives us life. And then we go, oh, my goodness, we messed up the climate. But on a regular, we do. Because it's, it's a profound disconnect, right? That draws me actually to a quote of yours that I was looking for, and I found it. It is about water, mm -hmm. um, and it says, the diverse peoples of the African continent carried radiant ancestral sources to those waters of mortal struggle and the sacred and secular performances of the African diaspora arise from a dynamic amalgam of multiple streams of knowledge and ways of knowing, traditions of cosmology, language, history, voice, recognition, and reconnection. So it kind of makes me think about how water serves as, yes, it's like a healing, rejuvenating entity, but it's also the thing that transported a lot of people to their doom mm. um, and it could be tough mm. and there's currents of it and it could be scary mm. um, so it remind it, it just makes me think about how water is not it's not simple it's mm. not straightforward mm. it's complex mm. and it could it could tear you apart mm. 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 That in many cultures there's a pr there are proverbs about water and wind right it could it could be gentle or it could be a hurricane. It could be, right? It could be uh, a reflective brook or it could be a tsunami, right? Right, and, and that that's emblematic of the complexity of life. What also comes to my mind, Gabby, as you're talking and um, in the beautiful reflections that the community is bringing forward is that we're also profoundly disconnected from how people traveled through most of human history. One is we used to walk. And imagine that the first peoples who call this the Great Turtle Island, so you have, you've seen what is the settler colonial nation of the US. You've seen it on a map, right? Can you see how it kind of looks like a turtle? The people didn't have GPS then. They knew the shape of the land because people had walked it, walked the whole thing. Right. And then the water, right? Even my grandparents, the way they came to this country as also immigrants from the Caribbean, people took boats. So there's some remembering for us about ways of journey over time, too. Right. Yeah. And then when I also think about migration, mm. I think especially to this country, mm. I think about identity mm. and the different ways that migration, yeah, it takes us to this. It, it gives people new opportunities. Mm. That's why people do it. Um, but it could also create this turmoil, this inner turmoil, not only for the immigrant, but for their children and for their children's children and for their children's children. It, it keeps going on. It keeps going on. Um, so it, April Felipe's piece, which I know what we're going to say. Perfect timing. I was, I was just going to say, maybe you want to talk about April Felipe. Yeah. <laughs> April Felipe's piece. Um, right. You guys probably saw it earlier. It's the piece with this. It's right there. Mm -hmm. It's the piece with the white ghost on top of this table. They'll probably show it in another picture. But the table actually looks like a rug. Like it's woven pieces of yarn, mm -hmm. which she did on purpose. And her piece is intended to investigate April Felipe. Her parents were, they were born in Queens, or she was born in Queens, New York, to immigrant parents who also immigrated from the Caribbean. And her piece is meant to investigate that idea of finding belonging in your identity 
and finding belonging in different aspects of your identity. And if you look at the piece, there's different there's different elements from different cultures. So for example, there's tiles that are meant to be um, similar to European style tiles that a lot of Caribbean people use to try and distance themselves from their more African and indigenous identities. Um, but one thing I thought was funny is April Felipe talks about how those tiles were actually Let's say um, the Europeans were influenced by Moroccans who are, you know, Morocco is in Africa. So it, like they were trying to dissociate from the African identity, but they could, there's no escape. They could not do it. Um, so with her piece and with the idea of exploring your identity, I wonder how do you guys navigate your individual identities um, being located somewhere where is your origin, like you're born, I was at least born in the United States, so it's my origin, but at the same time, it wasn't my parent, it wasn't my mom's origin, you know, and it wasn't, it, it, there was some turmoil to have me be here, you mm. understand what I'm saying? So how do you navigate being in a diverse group, which is beautiful, like I love meeting people with different histories, but at the same time, not being somewhere where you were, you're surrounded by people who look like you mm. and who have the same shared collective identity as you. Big, beautiful question. <laughs> One of the things that comes up for me is how we, I'm going to take a chance and say we, sometimes it's not that we don't like who we are or that we are um, that we start out saying, you know, I, I don't want to be, you know, or I'm, I'm denigrating my spot, but that I want to identify with the successful, affluent group. And I may not think about it at first as that I am denigrating my group. I'm saying I want to affiliate I want to have the nice tiles. No, I don't want no mud on my wall. I want the nice tiles. Right? I'm not, right? I'm, I don't start out by thinking, right? And I, I think about that, um, you know, in the day-to-day -day relational way, right? How many times we wish to, you know, we, I think it's human to want to feel liked and successful. How many times are we not interrogating, looking critically at the things we participate in? Were you thinking something? Yeah. I think uh, one question that comes to me around this, but is, uh, it, I guess it brings to mind also, and going back to Felipe's question around belonging, so when when one has to navigate multiple worlds simultaneous, mm -hmm. right? But is not, but does not fully find home in any of them, then where is one's place, right? So I am the child of an immigrant, right? And I have a relation, a deep relationship of longing and wanting more connection with my family in Egypt, right? with a uh, diaspora here. And when I'm in Egypt, you know, I get the pass as the American cousin a little bit, right? So my aunties aren't hard on me in the same way that they might be to my other cousins. Or, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I feel a sense of connection and home, but not fully, not at all of me, mm -hmm. right? Like, not necessarily, I mean, yes, all of me and, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this is also, this is, this is for sure a part of the story of migration, for, and all of us have experienced migration, right? Be it forced, be it, you know, um, elected, et cetera. So I think part of this is like, how, I, I'm also interested and curious about your thoughts on innovation, how we weave together 
different parts of our identity, different stories, from the place that we find ourselves in, from the places we come, from our people, that known and unknown, right? Knowingly, unknowingly. And then how that becomes this kind of new imagining, a place that can be fertile for, um, fertile for deepening of connection with one another in our shared humanity, but also it can become a kind of, uh, I don't wanna say cyborg, you know, like in terms of, in a mechanical type of way, but a kind of, a different type of hybridity that can arise, a different type of, I, maybe hybridity is not exactly the word, maybe a different type of, uh, yeah, a newness that can be there, that mm -hmm. can come, that is also connected to oldness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that I think about. I turn to, um, and I look to my dear friend Cliff Ward, who is an incredible artist. Mm. We have spoken about the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is actually the book of coming forth into day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to, to have one's journey, mm -hmm. right, in this way as, as we move forward, mm -hmm. held by the knowledge and understanding of, of those before, mm -hmm. and also still moving mm -hmm. with a kind of new wonder and new, you know, kind of openness mm -hmm. to where we are in the present mm -hmm. and then where we may be headed to. Mm -hmm. Is this something? Mm -hmm. Can we say the name of this piece? Because that feels so pertinent. Oh, this is Yet I Am Still Here to See You. Yet I Am Still Here to See You. Yeah. And, oh, yes. I just wanted to, um, and yet, and I think this place, piece, as I know that you were, um, as I look to, as we have spoken when you were getting your hair braided, mm. right? And we've spoken about, and yet I'm here to see you, and yet what holders of memory? The water holds the memory, and then Felipe's use of hair here. That's the hair, that's good. Is anyone, does anyone have any thoughts about their hair? Not just hairstyles, but does anyone have any connection with their hair? Like, oh. What are your thoughts on your hair, Gabby? Oh, my hair. Go. Oh yeah, please, so your hair would be so beautiful. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Thank you for saying that. It looks very healthy as well. <laughs> it looks really healthy. Like, what products are you like? I'm genuinely serious. Like, what type of products? We'll talk after about the hair products that you're using. Um, but no, I love that. Um, I went through it. Oh, no. You're going to say something? Just to think that, like, uh, 200 years, 30 for bringing, you know, to bring, because I think hair is a place where we can, for all women, let's even open that up, hair is a place where we can really look at the complexity, right? Like my mom, my mom would cry if, if I say she don't like my hair. She, she would cry. 
But she did try to make it look different, right? In order for, in her knowing, for it to look nice within the society and the dominant values, right? And how people are constantly navigating our beloveds and, and our recognition of who they are in all of their complexity. And the dominant society that has very clear aesthetic choices, right? There's very clear aesthetic messages that we get. And I think we still get very clearly complicated women in general, people in general, about our hair and how it represents us. You got silver in your hair, you don't have silver in your hair, they'll never know if you have silver in your hair, right? Is it curly, is it straight, how long is it? And then we were talking in, in one of our earlier circles, because we've been, we've been circling on Zoom for a few days this week, right? About the business of hair. Now hair is a big business. The selling of one woman's hair to other women. Right. So lots of rich complexity about identity and navigating, right? We use that verb navigating, which comes from crossing the sea, right? Navigating the complexity of what it means to be and be and also always be in some struggle with our society where we always trying to put ourselves in boxes, right? Because the universe is so big, we're falling from the sky, we can't help us, you know, come on. This is this and this is that, but as soon as we start doing that, we lock ourselves in, okay? A constant navigation, it seems like. So um, I wanted to go back to what you said really quickly um, about this, this uh, so connecting, connecting the pieces here. For, for myself, how I connected them. Um, you were told that over and over your hair it had to be straight, it had to be straight, it had to be straight. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna name that, I'm not gonna speak mm -hmm. for your personal experience, but what I, what I heard was that um, among your people, just like among my people, your hair need to be straight and longer so you can get as close to looking white as possible because that is what's gonna get you acceptance or get you the job or make sure you're liked or have people perceive you as civilized and good acting, whatever. Um, and I wanted to go, you know, what you were saying before about, uh, I want you to actually restate, I'm gonna, I feel like I'm gonna butcher it, but you were talking about migration and identity. What was the exact thing that you said? You <laughs> okay, never mind, never mind. Make it up again. Okay, okay wait, I, wait. Wanted, I wanted to bring that up again. I wanted to, to ask if anybody here um, wanted to talk about hair and the memory in your hair and um, in, in the That's memories. Uh, okay, oh, you saw somebody, okay. okay. So, so if one, anybody. One, I, just to name that, one of the reasons why, why we're speaking about hair in Felipe's work is because the images in the back, the wallpaper, are actually like what looks like decorative patterns are actually braids. And so just in case people did not catch that. And also just naming, uh, so that's, that's repeated. There's another, Im I don't know if everybody saw that, but. Um, it's hard to see. It's hard to see. But there's also images of bananas in the back and of fruit as well. So this is also, and we'll see a close up in just a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but again, here Felipe is utilizing some of these, uh, like different, like this is kind of decorative pattern. So, but that's why we're speaking of hair oh, specifically in this case. Here. So here's the right. the hair. The hair. The, the bananas. Oh, sorry, could you go too back? quick? <laughs> um, thank you so much, Julio. If you could go back to the previous uh, one. So, I wanted to. What I was trying to ask, I've got it now. Does anybody want to talk about their hair? And in your own way, you know, how have you experienced somebody just trying to straighten you out? <laughs> straighten you out. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know how you you would asked about how do you feel um what is it like you said many worlds and 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 uh mm. um the many worlds that you're from and mm. and do you feel like you belong or do you have a sense of belonging having left one place or gone to another or having come from people that left one place mm -hmm. and are mm -hmm. in another now do you feel at home mm -hmm. uh do you feel at home where you are how do you how do you create a feeling of home mm -hmm. and rootedness and connection uh where you are so there's a, a bunch of things that came mm -hmm. up that i just wanted mm -hmm. to bring up again and ask if anybody wanted to talk about it, and you said somebody did. Mm. Yeah. That's a good one. Oh, someone back there. You had your hand up back there. You had your hand up. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, you know, I was like Latina and uh, how lately I spent the last five years, you know, naturally. And, um, and if I was a child, I would feel stressed, social pressure in a very small town in Wisconsin is that your hair has to be curly. Mm -hmm. and my hair has to be super straight. <laughs> so I was pushed into getting perms because I don't fit mm -hmm. with the hair. Yeah. And your senses of whatever you have is just curling up. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a mm -hmm. certain level of that also. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. And when you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. when, when makes you feel at home, mm -hmm. that really spoke to me as well. I come from a long line of farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were the first generation long line farmers. Mm -hmm. I was the second in my entire extended family of many generations back mm -hmm. to the number to go to university and have mm -hmm. a good education. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful reconnecting and maybe a beautiful bridging to bring you, Lugo's work into the conversation, the village cobbler, as our time is almost up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. This idea of how do I make home out of these fragments? Yeah, so this is Roberto Lugo's piece, The Village Potter. Um, it, this picture is beautiful, but it does not show how big this is. This is actually probably like, what, 40, 20, 40 feet tall. You could go inside and like walk around in there. It's absolutely massive. Um, and his pieces are all porcelain. So Roberto Lugo was born in Philadelphia to Puerto Rican parents. And the entire point of his village potter demonstration is to take something like porcelain, like China, that seems traditionally like traditionally, you know, upper class, reserved for the elite, or even just like fancy. Like, dude, any of you guys have a china cabinet or a living room with a china cabinet? Were you allowed in it when you were children? <laughs> no, like you're not. Like you don't touch it. It's for, uh oh, it's oh no, no, you can't go there. Um, and so his piece is supposed to take something that's considered really elite, expensive, high class, and then to take people of color and especially iconic people of color and just slap their face on it. And he wants to stun his audiences. He wants to stun people and he wants to show, he wants to show people that, he, he wants to take spaces that traditionally did not have people of color in them and then insert people of color or iconic people who were not associated with these elite upper class things and pair them together. Um, and he also really strongly believes in art as means of healing and art as a way of, as a way of sort of rescuing people, a way to express your emotions. Uh, so my question with this one would be, do you guys feel as though 
do you guys feel as though his work is a way of a way of an act of rebellion or more so exploration or a little bit of both? What do you think? Oh, I personally think that there are his art is rebel. I see his art as rebellion, especially having I've seen him talk before and I've seen how much passion that he has. Um, I see him as taking something and in the eyes of some, in the eyes of some who are maybe more closed-minded, defiling it um, and doing that as a way of drawing attention in a, a dramatic way. Right. That in a way the work brings together the complexities that we're talking about, right? And the work as exhibited, right, both precious and not precious and precious, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And right. so complex histories that we sit in, right, as culture makers, as though everything that humans make is not culture. Yeah. yeah. And when you guys were talking about the shards, um, about the fragments, and you specifically, you mentioned the. Um, the gold lining that is used to repair. Um, and then you mentioned how, you know, pottery could be this fragmentation. It reminds me of the title of the collection that this group is in, uh, The Fragile Earth. And the whole point of that is to show like where we could be vulnerable, but also be strong at the same time. And I think something that it had mentioned was how clay is very mushy and soft, and you may think of it as weak, but then once you harden it, you're like, oh, it's hard. But it's actually easier to shatter once it's harder, you know, once it becomes that, like, once you cook it in the oven and it, it firms. Um, and there's a line I wanted to mention about the, the vase and how, let me find it. It was about the vase and how, I'll paraphrase it, I'll paraphrase it. It was when you take a vase that is broken and do that thing where you <laughs> re reassemble it with re a reassemble it, it re with remember it. yeah where you re remember it where you reassemble it it's that glue that makes the vase stronger than it it's even stronger than it was when it was whole because that glue is fighting to hold it together uh, whereas when it was whole it was just whole but when it's it has glue now it has this like almost love like reinforcing the wholeness of the vase I thought that was interesting. That is the most beautiful closing image. <laughs> I want to let you have the last word. Okay. I'll give you a. I'll give you a. a yeah. Wait. A, a, a side note word. Okay. Do you have a side note word over there, too, Doctor? Doctor, sister. No, we were, Gabby and I agree that we would love to hear a story from you or um, poetry, if you want to, if you're not, if you're not moved. Mm. What a moving gathering. I want to leave an offering and this light, I'm not gonna even try to pick up a piece of paper. I, I want to leave an offering to our beloved Gina, Masa Amani, whose parents wrote on her tomb, Gina, you will never die. Gina, you will never die. From the seeds of your blood and your laughter, a million moons are rising. Thank you so much for this story. Um, something for you all to ponder. Hope you guys also enjoyed our time together. And although I couldn't fit everything that I learned in the past couple of months, I hope you guys got a nice condensed version of it and you take something home with you tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming out.
Get um, home safe. <laughs> Oh, Gabby. Um, yeah, with so much gratitude for your presence here. Uh, our, our final, our third and final installation of this series is happening um, Thursday, Octo uh, October. December. We're time traveling. Uh, <laughs> December 15th at 6 p.m. Um, we will be, Jose, uh, who is our student scholar, will be in conversation with Omar Afendam, who is a a uh, Syrian-American hip-hop artist and poet, a uh, peace activist and scholar. That will be a really beautiful and dynamic conversation as well. Um, and we hope that you'll join us. Thank you so much for coming, and it's been an honor to be with you. And what a great group of conversationalists. Thank you so much. Give ourselves a hand. So beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>